So last week we oh, talked yeah. about um, function calls, right? Uh, specifically on Linux, um, on 32-bit and 64-bit uh, x86 CPUs, how um, the function call, how the, the calling convention works, right? Um, so on 32-bit, so let's say that we have a function f and we want to call it with arguments 1, 2, 3. Uh, so just to recap, um, on x86, um, which was a, it's a 32-bit architecture, um, uh, so what do we do? We, we push, which one would we push first? Yeah, yeah, right to left, right? Um, so we push three, push two, push one, and then call F, right? Um, and that's like, it's our main function, and then in, you know, it might have more code, and then in F, um, it does whatever it needs to do with these arguments on the stack, um, and then uh, to return a value, what register does it return values in? So we use EAX um, to be the return value. Let's just say it always returns five. And then to actually return execution to where main called F, what do we do? Yeah, and there's one instruction that takes the saved instruction pointer and jumps there. Yeah, exactly, red. Right, so ret will take the saved instruction pointer, um, it'll pop it off the stack, and then jump there, all in one instruction. Um, and then on uh, x86, 64, or AMD, 64, which is like obviously a 64-bit architecture, um, who can walk me through um, so does anybody remember what's different um, about the calling convention on x86 versus AMD64? Registers are not used to pass in every. Right. Well, the key difference is that we we do use some registers on AMD64, right? So on just x86, we use the stack for all of the arguments, right? Um, and then like so after the pushes. Uh, oh, it's, it's not the other way. Um, no, yeah, on x86, we use the stack for all of the arguments. Oh. Yeah. Um, and then it looks like 3, 2, 1 before the call, right? So that way, um, theoretically, f could like pop this into a register, pop this into a register, pop it into, re into a register, and it would get them in order. So that's, that's part of the reason why we push them backwards. Um, so that when you pop them off, they come off in order. Um, so that's, that's how x86 does it. Um, but then on AMD64, we move the first six arguments into uh, a set of registers. Um, so if anybody, does anybody happen to remember the list? Kevin, Patricia? <laughs> All right, so, um, so it's RDI, which I'm pretty sure that this stands for like destination index. Um, so in a lot of a lot of times, like the first argument to a function will be a destination to put something, um, kind of like a return value, but not, but kind of. Um, and then our SI, which if I'm remembering correctly, stands for like source index. Um, and then uh, what? Is it, isn't it like RA to eleven? Uh, close. It's close. So first there's RDX and then RCX, and then yeah. Um, oh God. Yeah, it's some. It's eight, nine, ten, or eleven. It's R D A R S I R D X R C X R A R nine. Does that sound right? Wow, I can't believe I'm forgetting this. Ooh, we might be like, we might be a lifesaver. Um, also, like a really good resource. I guess I should turn the projector back on. Um, a really good resource to figure these out. Um, because like. You know, you're not going to remember that list just right off the bat, obviously. Um, just Google, like, AMD64 calling convention. Time you listed R A X R D X R C X R D X R D I R S I. 
For for what Oh yeah, so there's no specific order to those, but those are like a set of registers that are used really commonly. Um, but the actual order that you push them in, uh, where is it? Okay, yeah, I, don't I don't need to talk about the order that you push them. System V, so D I S I D X D X. Okay, so it's eight nine um, on Linux. So like this is Linux specific, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can't just take a Linux binary and like expect it to be able to run on Windows. Uh, or Mac, um, but yeah, so I googled x86 calling convention and it gave me this Wikipedia article um, where uh, it breaks it down by architecture, so this is, you can't really see it, but it says 8086, so that's x86, um, and this is x8664, which is AMD64, and then it says the system 5 um, calling convention, which is like what most uh, Unixes might use, uh, and so it says Solaris, Linux, BSD, oh, okay, OSX uses the same calling convention. Um, uh, it's RDI, RSI, RDX, RCX, RA, R9, and then potentially these special registers, these are um, like, I can't remember what they're called, uh, maybe like vectorized registers, but these are like super big registers, um, and they might be like, those might be like 128 or 256 bits or something. Um, and you don't typically see them with like integer parameters. It's usually like floats uh, that are uh, stored in those registers. But if anybody um, figures out when those get used, let me know. Um, so yeah. Uh, right, so on AMD64, we would pass the first six arguments into those registers, right? So what would our call to F look like here? What's the first thing we have to do? Move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, move into what register? RDI. Uh-huh. What value? Uh, three. Close. So, Four. Uh, so, so on AMD 64, um, it's the first six arguments. Uh, that get put into those registers. And then if there are any others, like if we have, um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, right, those are the first six arguments. If we have any others, those will get pushed right to left. Um, but since we only have three in this case, uh, we move the first one in RDI, uh, we move the second argument into RSI, um, we move the uh, third argument into RDX, and then we call F. Right, might have more code. And then F, um, in our case, F again just returns five, so we can just move um, our AX five and red. Right. Um, so yeah, le like let's see an example where we have more arguments, maybe. Uh, so like seven and eight. Um, so on 32 bit, we push eight, right? Because we always start right to left. Push seven, all the way to push one, and then call F. And F is the same, right? Because F is dumb. It doesn't actually use its arguments in this case. Um, but then on AMD 64, I guess this, this stuff can stay the same, right? But then we, we, you know, we're not done with the first six arguments yet. Um, so move RCX, four, move <coughs> eight, five, move R9, six. And then we still have two arguments left, right? So what do we do with those? Those get pushed to the stack, what order? Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, so we push eight, and then we push seven, and then we call F. Um, in practice, especially these reverse engineering challenges, you don't typically see more than six arguments um, in C. I mean, it, it can happen, but it's kind of rare. Um, 
Yeah, in fact, like it's most common. To it's it's almost like a. Anybody know like the Pareto distribution or the the zip flaw? It's like it's really common to see functions with like one or two parameters. It's less common to see functions with like four parameters. Six is even less common, and then like beyond six is like really rare. Um, but that's how it works. Um, does that make sense to everyone so far? Awesome. Um, so, so we know how to call functions with arguments, um, and then that's cool and all, but uh, has anybody taken OS yet? Some of us, some of us not. Um, we have this concept of kind of layers of privilege. Um, so we say that like, uh, of the set of all instructions available to us, uh, we can kind of classify them into like user mode instructions and uh, outside of that is like kernel mode or privileged instructions. Sometimes you'll see this called like ring three and sometimes this is called like ring zero. Um, What's ISNS? Instructions. Um, okay. um, so the this whole ring zero, ring three terminology is really specific to uh, x86 and AMD64 chips. Um, but most processors uh, will have a concept of like, um, Instructions that really anybody should be able to execute, uh, even like guests on the system, and then instructions that uh, really only some entity that's been given uh, elevated privileges should be able to execute. Uh, so what that means for us is that uh, our programs will always be running uh, inside this sort of bubble. Uh, we can call it ring three or user mode. Um, and that can do stuff like uh, you know, like move, so like, uh, so what exists in ring three? Um, that could be like move, add, I don't know, multiply, uh, call, ret, um, you know, basically anything that's moving data around or jumping to some other spot in the code. Um, you know, that's, that's gonna be like your basic stuff. Uh, and then stuff that exists in ring zero, uh, you know, to be honest, I don't actually know like the names of a lot of instructions in ring zero, uh, but that's, it's going to be stuff that's like, um, you know, talking uh, to the hardware directly. Um, it's going to be like uh, uh, changing Page tables, which you don't really need to know what that is, but it's um, it's basically telling the CPU uh, where to find stuff physically in RAM. Um, but basically, any time we want to interact with the uh, outside environment, you know, we, we can move data around all we want inside of our process. But eventually, we're going to want to do things like read and write to files, uh, read and write to uh, you know internet sockets that are talking to other servers. Um, print stuff out to the screen, uh, get the time of day. Anytime we want to do something that's talking to the outside environment, we need to basically ask um, somebody in ring zero to do it for us. Um, it, so basically, the kernel acts on the user's behalf uh, when the user requests that the kernel do something. Um, and that's called a, a system call, right? Um, so this, this process where we're asking um, the kernel to do something is called a system call. Uh, so, how do we do these? Um, so, Linux has a a convention. I guess I'll just put it on the whiteboard. Um, so, Linux has a few conventions actually of how to. Uh, it's called entering the kernel. Um, because uh, really, the, 
we are asking the kernel to do something, but the way we ask it to do something is by directly jumping into its code. Um, uh, and of course, you're not allowed to just like randomly like jump into any part of the kernel because then that's basically what we've, what we've been showing that why buffer overflow attacks are bad for programs because if you can get a program to jump to any arbitrary place, more often than not, you can get it to uh, to, to do things it wasn't meant to do. Um, so, you know, CPU manufacturers uh, and you know, everybody who's like involved in designing, you know, simple architectures and whatnot back in the '60s and the '70s. Uh, came up with these various ways to um, to make kernel calls, to make system calls. Um, so uh, the way that Linux does it, right, because most of our challenges that we see in CTFs are Linux-based. Some are Windows-based. Um, but, you know, we tend to focus on teaching, like, exploitation on Linux, because um, that's just more often what you see. Um, so... Uh, So this is, these are two of Linux system calls conventions. Um, so one is called, uh, I can't remember, there's like a specific name for it, but uh, we'll just call it the int 80 convention. Um, what you do is you you pass your, uh, your parameters, what well, you pass, uh, pass a system call ID into EAX, um, and this basically says which system call you want to make. Um, so you can think of it as like an index into like a list of functions that you're allowed to, to do, right? So every process is allowed to make any kernel call, right? Um, any system call. Some of them might require elevated privileges and the kernel will say, hey, I got your, I got your system call. You're not allowed to do that though. But any process is allowed to execute any system call. Um, it just might result in an error. Uh, and then your parameters um, get put into EBX, um, ECX, EDX, it's like R8 and R9 again. I can never remember those. So let's do a bit of Googling again. Um, So I'll let that warm up, but uh, there already says so ESI, EDI, and EBP. Um, so ESI, EDI, and EBP. Right? So we're gonna do some simple counting. And how many parameters can a system call ever have maximum? 80? Um, so yeah, six, because we put the system call ID here. And then we put the parameters in here. Um, and just the fact that Intel's only, I mean, uh, Linux has only given us six registers to use for parameters. Um, that means that system calls have a maximum of uh, six parameters. Um, so how did I figure out those last few? Um, I Googled Linux syscall calling convention. And then there's the second link is a Wikipedia page and has a subheading called making a syscall. And then it says right here, EX, EBX, CX, and so on. Um, and then it tells us that the return value um, goes into EAX. Okay. So that's, oh, I'm sorry. Um, how, how do you actually jump into the kernel? Um, because you can move stuff into registers, but then like, it's just going to keep executing the rest of your code. How do you, how do you actually do the syscall? Uh, you run this instruction called int, and you give it a value of hexadecimal eight zero. Um, int, what that does is it creates what's called a software interrupt. Um, so basically, interrupts tell the CPU, hey, uh, stop, 
doing the normal thing that you do, which is just fetching the next instruction and executing it. Um, and instead, uh, you know, you have a table called a, an interrupt uh, table or an interrupt, um, what's it called? We'll call it an interrupt table. Um, and it says, look up the value OX80, and wherever it says that you're supposed to jump, go jump there. Um, and what happens at boot up time, um, at like system initialization or whatever, is the Linux kernel tells the CPU, hey, if you ever see interrupt OX80, here's where I want you to jump. And it's this specific function that basically looks at the, this parameter and then jumps to whatever code needs to execute when system call five is requested. Um, so yeah, so at boot up, uh, Linux will tell the CPU where to jump to if it sees interrupt 80 or OX80. Um, and then user programs, when they're running, they can, uh, they can you know, cause interrupt, suffer interrupt OX80, and then the CPU will jump into the Linux kernel in the right spot. Um, <clears throat> and then the Linux kernel will do what it needs to do based on the parameters you sent it. Um, and then it'll return a value in EAX. Um, so that's how, so this is one of the two available uh, entry points on, um, so this is, so we'll call it like the int80 interface and it's available on x86 and AMD64. Um, so that's one of them. Uh, there's another one called the sys enter interface, and I'm pretty sure it's available on both. And that one you're going to have to Google to figure out what it does, because I never see this in practice, and I never cared to memorize how to do it. Um, so, but it's it's a thing. And if you ever see, I mean, so what I do know is that um, you'll see. I can't remember it. it it might be passed in registers or it might be passed on the stack, but then you'll see this instruction sysenter. Um, and then, I don't know how it returns a value, but you'll see some stuff and then sysenter, and then now you know you have to Google the sysenter uh, uh, calling convention. Um, but uh, the one that you see really often in 64-bit binaries is the uh, kind of a conflated term like I specifically call it system calling and not just syscalling because syscall is an instruction available to us um, and it's only available on AMD64. Um, so kind of the same thing that we saw with function calling. Uh, we have like these six registers. Um, so we have these six registers, so it's pretty similar to that, um, uh, it, and it's it's the same with like the interrupt eighty interface where you uh, you move into RAX um, the syscall ID, and these IDs are going to be different for all three interfaces. Um, you just have to Google like, uh, oh hey, what's the Linux system calling um, like system call IDs for you know, X60, uh, like AMD64, because um, five here is gonna mean something different than five over there. Uh, so, but you move the system call ID here, and then you, you basically use these registers, right? RDI, RSI, RDX, RCX, R8, and R9. Um, why did I put an asterisk next to RCX? Um, the syscall instruction the way that it stores, so, and then you do a syscall. Um, all of these need some way of restore, uh, of uh, storing the return address, right? So like what we saw with the call instruction, what does that do? It pushes the return address onto the stack, right? Um, at least this and this don't do that. I don't know about sysenter, uh, but the way that these both store the return address is they store it in a register. Um, I don't remember what it is uh, for software interrupts, but there's there's probably like a saved um, EIP register that's used for software interrupts. 
uh, the way that syscall does it is it saves the return address in RCX. So obviously we can't use RCX to pass a parameter because it's just going to get overwritten when we hit the syscall, right? Um, so instead of using RCX, uh, we just use R10. So that's why there's this kind of funky like 1089. If you just remember that it's basically the function calling convention, but RCX is a different register, then it kind of makes sense. Um, and then the, the result, just like int 80, is put into RAX. Uh, so they're pretty similar, int 80 and syscall. Um, you'll see this uh, really often in 32-bit binaries. Even though I'm pretty sure sysenter is available for x86, I haven't really seen it in any challenges. Has anybody seen sysenter in any challenges? Yeah. I don't know, that might be kind of fun, like just all, all these things that like are really rare to see make for like kind of fun challenges because it always like teaches you something new instead of just like the same old stuff. Um, but you'll see this most often in 32-bit binaries um, and then this you'll see in 64-bit binaries because it's, this is way faster than doing this. Um, obviously moving into the registers is like the same speed but the um, software interrupts are a lot slower uh, in general than, um, than this is designed to be. Because uh, these, a software interrupt, um, it doesn't really know what, uh, like a software interrupt is a really broad idea and it doesn't really know what the handler is designed to do. So it has to save a whole bunch of state about the currently running process. Whereas um, this says, oh, hey, kernel developers, uh, whenever a user calls this syscall thing, I'm only gonna save like a couple things. One of them is the return address, and I don't know, probably like a couple other things, like the interrupt mask, and uh, just just like a very like a small set of things, because it's only designed to do one thing. Whereas software interrupts um, are a really broad topic, uh, so this is faster than that, which is why you see this really often on 64-bit binaries. Um, questions? What did you say about the R10 and RCX? Yeah, so remember how like function calling is basically this, except it, it was RCX is the fourth one. Um, so syscall, when you execute a syscall, it saves the instruction pointer, right? The address of the next instruction, it saves it in RCX. So that once the kernel's done doing its stuff, it can return uh, into that address. Um, uh, one of, I mean, obviously one of the things that the kernel first does is it saves uh, all these parameters because these are like general purpose registers. We're probably going to use it in kernel code. Uh, so it saves these. And then for, for a syscall, system call, uh, it's going to save RCX as a return address. Um, so since we're saving the, something in RCX, like you can think of it as another parameter basically to the kernel, to the system call, uh, we can't pass the fourth argument um, in RCX anymore. So we, Linux just chose a different register for that, and they chose R10. Yeah. So that middle one, it's the center, mm -hmm. it's supposed to go no, like there's nothing, no three letters there? S no three letters? Well, E-A-X. Oh, it, it returns somewhere. It, it returns the value, the, it returns the return value of the system call somewhere. It might be in a register, it might be in the stack. I just, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. Um, but it might be on this Wikipedia page. Um, int 80, syscall, library call. No, it's not even on this page. I might be mistaken. L Linux might not have a sysenter entry point. Okay. I know it's used on Windows for sure. Um, So, sysenter was added on I586, which was, I think, like Pentium 2. Um, specifically tied to 32 bit applications. Okay. So, 
So it looks like it passes arguments on the stack. Um, or maybe just saves a few. Uh, no, it sa okay. It saves a few registers. Just says what it registers with. Save. Well, I don't know. So it says it was added in. I'm, I'm pretty sure I586 is Pentium 2. Um, or maybe that's Pentium 1. It's one of the early Pentiums. And obviously, like, none of these challenges are going to be compiled for, uh, for like a Pentium 1 or a Pentium 2, unless it's like a more advanced challenge. Um, Yeah. And so there's definitely some references online, um, but we don't really see it that often. Um, I haven't seen it at all. Um, but it's going to follow like a similar convention probably, except registers might be different. Um, apparently, you have to save some registers because the handler for a sysenter is allowed to clobber certain registers without restoring them. Um, so. Uh, it, you, they basically saved a few registers, like pushed them onto the stack, and then move values into the right registers, uh, and then uh, execute the center. And then I don't know where it returns the value. Um, so that's a bunch of question marks in my brain right now. But um, yeah, questions. Okay. Um, so what's uh, What's like the key difference between a function call and a system call? Because they're both like, you know, passing some parameters into some function and then jump into that function and then get a return value back. What's what's the difference between the two though? Uh, you're not involved in the operation of the function call. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a system call is asking the OS to do something, um, and it's in the process of doing so. Whenever you hit one of these, the minute it jumps into the kernel, it's going to be in a privileged mode. Um, I don't know how this is set up. Maybe the interrupt table says uh, for every interrupt whether or not it's supposed to be privileged. Or maybe it's like below or above a certain value. Um, but somehow, uh, once you get into the kernel, it's in a privileged mode. Because um, if you try to execute kernel code uh, and you're unprivileged, if you're in ring three, you're just going to get a bunch of errors. Like the minute you try to execute an instruction that requires, um, like ring zero privileges, the the CPU will just like throw an error. It'll throw a fault. Um, and then depending on how your OS handles those, either it'll just tell the process, "Hey, you ex you tried to execute an illegal ex instruction," um, or the OS will just like kill your process, just depending on how it's configured. Um, and how you've set up your uh, um, your signal handlers, um, but yeah. So want to see a demo? Sure. Okay. Um, so that's how you do it, and then to do it. Uh, oh, who's used Git before? Yeah. Um, only downloaders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just there any other reason? Right. <laughs> always, uh, just always force push master, right? Um, who knows what Git is or knows that it exists? Okay. Um, so, uh, Git is uh, what's called a, a version control system. Um, when more than one person is working on a project, or even one person is working on a project, um, you know. Think about both of you editing the same file, uh, and then, you know, now you have two versions of the same project, right? Or even just one of you updating a project. How do you make sure that the other person has the updated version? Like, I guess you could bring it in on flash drive or email it to them or something. Uh, but those are all kind of ad hoc, and uh, I mean, maybe you could build a really um, good, you know, 
system out of that if you follow conventions or whatever, but there's simpler ways. Um, so Git is a really popular program that manages different versions of a, a software repository. Um, and basically, I won't teach you the whole thing today, maybe I'll touch upon it, but uh, two commands you need to, that was weird. Two commands you need to know are git clone, uh, which takes a URL, and git pull. Uh, so git clone is like, so if there's a git repository that's hosted online, um, you give it that URL and it copies it locally, the entire repository, all the versions um, of the code in that repository. Uh, and then it also creates uh, kind of a link locally which says, uh, oh, oh, this is where we pulled the repository from. If the user ever wants to update in the future, this is where we should pull from. Um, and then git pull, what it'll do is, it'll basically uh, pull in any changes that have been added remotely um, and, and show them in your local repository and then up, also update the local copy to the newest version um, all in one go. So this is how we copy a repository that's available online and this is how we update it to the current, uh, to the latest version um, that's online, typically. Um, so uh, if you guys go to pound exploitation meetings in Slack, is everybody on Slack, by the way? Mm. Yeah? Cool. Yeah, so pound exploitation meeting should have a, a link. Oh, well, no, it's not there. <laughs> Where did I put it? Oh, okay, if you go to info, it's on the right-hand side. Um, this is, so the, the first one is uh, my repository. Um, the second one is Kevin's repository. Um, if you hit the, the I button, um, channel details. Uh, and then if you go to that link, it's, it's just a web page, right? But you can also use that link, um, like so, by, oh, that's not right. Yeah, there we go, that's how you zoom in. Um, if I git clone, and then followed by that URL, it'll create a new folder based on the, I guess the, the base name, right, of the path you give it, like the, the, the thing after the last slash. It'll create a folder um, and basically copy down um, all of that code and all those versions. Um, and this is where I keep demo code that I use in these meetings. Um, and since I already have demo code for system calls, I'm just gonna use that. Um, and it's in one of them. What's that? I'm trying to look up, sorry. Somewhere in yeah, exactly. If you've already cloned a repository in the past, um, just git pull to right. get the latest version. I have to be in the right directory. Uh, yeah, you have to be in the root directory of the repo or any of its subdirectories. Alright, there are better ways that I can figure out what a what directory this is under. Okay, so if you go into the March 6th directory, so that's 2018-03-06, um, I have a bunch of files, which I should probably clean. Oh, I can't clean, never mind. Um, I'll just delete them. Yeah. 
So uh, you should see a bunch of these .s files. Is, has anybody uh, gone to that directory yet? Do you see these .s files? Yes? So I'm pretty sure this is the simplest example. Um, so, um, so this is syntax for a certain assembler called uh, NASM. It stands for, for uh, the NetWide Assembler. It's just one of the most common assemblers uh, that we use. Uh, if you write your own assembly for x86 or AMD64 or a few other architectures too. Um, so this whole bit right here um, is necessary for NASM to compile your code correctly. Um, and it basically says that this label underscore start, um, once you compile it, keep that label in there because the linker needs to know where my, this is the main function basically, right? Um, uh, so like, if I didn't do this, the assembler would take this code, assemble it, and then just delete this label. Um, because everything is assumed to be uh, a local label unless you declare it to be global. Um, uh, so if you don't include this line, it'll assemble just fine, but then the linker will say like undefined reference to underscore start or something. Um, and then section.txt is necessary uh, because that tells the assembler once it's done assembling this, it should put it in the code section instead of the data section. Um, otherwise, you could have code that exists in your data section, but you're not allowed to execute it, which is kind of useless. Um, and then this is where we say, oh, here's my underscore start function. Um, uh, so I looked up the system call ID for exit. Um, so where do you, where do you find those? It's Linux. This searchable syscall table is really good for 64-bit, and this second link is really good for 32-bit. Um, let's look at the 32-bit one first. Uh, so it basically has this, this long table. Uh, it gives the name of them, um, and then it tells you what you need to put into the EAX register, and then it tells you what arguments it takes. And you see, like, like I was saying, it's really common to see like one or two arguments Three arguments is a little less common, and then like it's really kind of rare to see more than three arguments. But you're allowed to have. Um, I don't know. Why does this only have up to EDI? One, two, three, four, five. Didn't we figure out there's like a sixth register for uh, thirty-two bit? ESI, EDI. Yeah, EBP, right? I don't know, maybe, maybe nothing in Linux actually uses <laughs> that sixth argument. Um, but anyway, uh, this is like, you know, if you look at um, uh, man three, I think? Yeah, so um, you guys know like, or let's, what's uh, more common like um, man, man read, right? Like. Has anybody ever used this function in C before? Where you call read and you give it a file descriptor, a place to store um, the read in characters and a number of characters to read in, right? We have, and it's just a C function, right? But doesn't that kind of look similar to this assembly function, um, sysread? It takes a unsigned int file descriptor, um, a char pointer buffer, and a size T count. Um, Right, so different different names, but uh, it's basically the same thing. So a lot of functions in C um, are like thin wrappers around these system calls. Um, so like read is a super thin wrapper. Um, like write, open, exit. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff that just 
really maps cleanly to a system call. Um, we'll just be a really thin wrapper and see around that. Uh, but so I, I looked up sys exit, right? And it says system call ID one. And it takes an int um, error code or, or exit number, right? Uh, and that's what I pass in here, 72. Um, and I'm pretty sure really the only lower byte is cared about, I think. There's something with that. Uh, and then, like we saw before, interrupt OX80. Um, and then, so let's let's try compiling this. Uh, so there's a make file in that directory, which, oh geez, if you haven't worked with make files, this isn't that readable. So I apologize <laughs> about that. Um, but basically what it does is it calls my assembler, which is nasm um, with the flags uh, dash f elf, and that tells it the format it should output the assembled file in, um, and then it takes each of those files and then calls ld with the flags dash m elf i386, and that I think tells ld either what the input or the output should look like. I think this tells ld that it should expect a 32-bit um, a 32-bit file, and it should output a 32-bit binary, I think. Um, but yeah, so we, we can do it without the make file. Uh, um, so you do nasm, you can't really see that. So you get nasm um, dash f elf, and if you're doing a 64-bit file, it'd be um, dash f elf 64. Uh, but this is a this is 32-bit code. I mean, I guess it could be 64-bit code, but let's just do 32-bit for now. Um, and then you give it the name of the file, which is exit.s in this case. Um, .s is really common for, uh, it's a really common extension for assembly. Um, and then what does that give us? That gives us a file called exit.o, right? Um, if we ask file, what kind of file that is, it says it's, a, it's an elf file, which is a, Linux um, executable and linkable format. Um, and it says it's a relocatable. Basically, we can't run this thing. Um, oops. I mean, I definitely can't run it if I tell my system that I'm not allowed to run it. But um, uh, you can't run it because it's not an actual binary yet. Um, so you have, to, you have to link it together, which is the last step in the not technically compilation, but it's the last step in uh, compiling a program to a uh, to proper executable. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, elf I386. Okay, um, and so what does that give us? That gives us uh, a dot out. Um, otherwise, we can specify a name with um, dash O and then like call it exit or something. And then that gives us a binary called exit. And when we run exit, it ran, but whoa, we got an error. Why did we get an error? Well, let's figure out what the return code was. Oh, 72, that looks pretty familiar, right? Um, so that's what that argument does, right? That's the, the return code for the process. Um, so if instead I return zero, um, and I'm just gonna do this the lazy way now. Um, if I return zero and run it again, um, whoa, there was no error, right? Why is that? Because the return code was zero, right? So that's um, on Unix-like systems, a return code of zero means no error, um, and anything non-zero means there was an error of some sort. And usually the documentation will say, oh, an error code of one means this type of error, an error code of that means that type of error. Um, so you get an error when you hit 32? Yeah, so when I, when I uh, this is, so this code right here is essentially the same as like doing this in C. Oh. Um, doing that in C, right? Uh, that's the first argument. So if you give anything non-zero to exit, that's like seen as like, no error, um, I exited normally. And then if you give anything that's non-zero, um, that's uh, that's basically saying there was an error of some sort. Um, 
Did I say if you give it zero, that's no error. If you give it non-zero, that's some sort of error. Um, questions so far? Um, all right, so let's look at the next one. Uh, Hello.s. Um, so, all right, one thing I haven't gone over yet is uh, how you store strings and like data in NASM. Um, so in NASM you have, or in, in assembly in general, you have, um, you have instructions and then you have pseudo instructions. Um, so instructions are things that the CPU actually executes. Um, and then pseudo instructions are basically instructing the assembler to store something or to do something. Um, uh, you know, so these aren't actually executed on the CPU. They're just telling the assembler I want to do something um, with this file. Uh, so what DB does is it stores um, a byte, right? That's what the B stands for. It stores a byte or an array of bytes. Um, and then you give it an expression of the bytes you want to store. Uh, so I gave it this string um, backticks, mean interpret escapes, it's like a C style escape, right? Interpret it as a new line instead of a backslash N. If I gave it, um, if I gave it just normal double quotes, it would store backslash N in the string. Um, but since I gave it back quotes, uh, this is storing the string, hello world new line, right? Um, and then, so that's what, that's what DB does. And then this is, um, so DB takes a label, right? Um, so my string holds the address of that string. Um, and then uh, my string len, so uh, EQU in NASM um, takes an expression and then uh, this value stores the, the result of that expression. Um, so it doesn't, this isn't put at, an, at a place and this stores an address like this does, right? My string stores the address of this array whereas my string len equals uh, this result. So then basically anywhere where it sees my string len, it says, oh, no, 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 like if this was like 10, it says, oh, I'm actually gonna replace that with 10. Um, whereas my string, if this is like address OX, I don't know, 30A or something, it'll replace this with OX30A. Um, because so like, if you said that like my string equals a string, it would replace this with like H E L L or something. You know, like this. The, I, I'm pretty sure that would be illegal, but um, that's the difference. Like DB stores the address of the thing there, and then EQU stores the value of the expression um, at that in, in that uh, that variable. Questions. Dollar sign represents. Yeah. What the heck is that, right? Um, so when the assembler is going through your code, it always keeps track of um, like what is the address that I'm currently assembling into. Um, so when I say section dot data, uh, essentially what that does is it changes that value. Um, so uh, let's say that the data section is at OX 300 and the text section is at like OX 400. Um, so when I when it sees section dot data, it says, okay, I'm currently going to assemble everything into OX 300. Um, so then, the minute that it goes to this line, it's like, okay, I'm currently assembling into OX 300, and it interprets this instruction as, okay, at OX 300, I need to store these bytes: hello, comma, world, exclamation mark, new line. Um, uh, and then, however long that was, so like. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 characters, right? So that stores 14 characters. And then after it's done doing that, um, it's going to put the next thing at OX 30E? Yeah, right? E is 14? Does it store, like you said, it didn't store. Right, so it's, it's only, um, this is the address that the next instruction would assemble into if this stores anything at all. Um, this might store nothing at all, in which case the next line would also be going into OX30E, 
right? But the assembler at all times, before it reads the next instruction, it has to know where it would assemble it to um, before it even reads the instruction. But with regard to the length of what the 300, it's storing the address of, of the hello world string, not the string itself there, right? Or is it storing the Right, well, actually, so what this, what this does, um, if we have our, our like target binary, you know, we have OX300 here, it actually stores H E L L O world, right? Um, and then possibly more stuff, right? Uh, but then it stores this value, right? It stores 300 in that, so my string equals OX300 now, okay. right? So it stores this at the place that it's supposed to be assembling into, um, updates that pointer, right? So now, um, right, the next thing that we're gonna store into is OX30E, right? So it updates that, and then, um, and then stores the place uh, that it assembled into, into here. I mean, that's what DB does, right? into the variable my string. So the assembler keeps that in mind. Yeah. So like uh, like in C if we have this like um, global there's no I don't think that's a keyword. If we have like a like an int um, or a void pointer uh, I don't know current location, right? Um, when it sees the section dot data, it says, okay, uh, current loc equals OX300. Um, and then when it sees DB, it says, okay, well, um, this is like pseudocode, but like, it stores that string wherever current location is, and then it says uh, void pointer my string equals current location, right? So it stores, um, it copies that into my string, and then it updates current location uh, plus 14 times, right? Because it stored 14 bytes. Um, so that's that's what this DB instruction does. Um, basically, this, right? Um, this is like the section dot data, and this is like the DB instruction, right? So that's like going on in the assembler. But that's something that the assembler keeps track of. That's not something that is actually like it uses that to make text replacements later. In, or basically, yeah, yeah. It, it stores this string somewhere in the binary. And then anytime it sees my string, it replaces my string with the, the address that it's stored at. That's the question. Yeah. 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 Questions? All right, so, so that's DB. And then, um, so since we updated the current location before we started executing the next instruction, um, so we're, we're currently looking at 30E. Um, and what EQU will do is it takes an expression, um, it, and so all it does is it says like, uh, like in this case, it's an int. I think EQU is only for ints, really. I'm not sure about that. But what it does is it says like, int my string len equals like this weird dollar minus my string. Okay, what is what is dollar? Um, so in this example, dollar is current location, right? It's the place that we would be assembling this code into if uh, if it had to assemble anything at all, if it had to store anything at all. Um, so all dollar sign is is it's the oops, it's the current it's the location that we're currently assembling into. And then, so what would this equal? What would current location minus my string equal if they're both pointers? Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, which is the, the length of the string, Sorry, right? Zero x. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So dollar would be the place that we would be assembling into at the current location, and then my string is the place that we stored hello world, right? And since um, since there's no gap between the two, right? Ox three oe minus this is just the length of our string, right? That's kind of weird, so I know there's going to be questions. Yeah, really? Last time I did it, I know it was confusing. I think maybe because I asked enough questions about the thing before it that I understood what the thing was doing, so that okay. I didn't know why, why it makes sense to reference it all the time. Okay. So yeah. Good. Yeah, it's kind of weird. It's like in a pseudo instruction, you can reference the address that it's at is kind of weird. Um, and it's even weirder when like it's an instruction that actually stores something <laughs> in memory. This, this isn't just like C code where the code is code that's being interpreted as stuff that's actually run. This is also kind of instructions to the assembler, right? Exactly. Like it's yeah. telling the assembler how to assemble other things that are yeah. what we are going to run. Yeah. Basically like these two pseudo instructions change how the assembler interprets the rest of the file, right? Because now instead of saying like my string, that's not an integer, it'll just see, oh, I have a definition for my string. Replace it with OX300, right? Um, so these are almost like macros. Yeah, sort of. yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, they're, they're kind of like macros. Um, some of them can have side effects though, right? Like storing data somewhere. Um, so, what was I gonna say? Let's say taking compiler. Side effects. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. So that's why we call these instructions because they're things that the CPU is actually going to do. It's going to execute those, and we call these pseudo instructions because they're really just instructions to the assembler. We tell the assembler uh, to do something and possibly interpret the rest of the file a, a different way. So, does this make sense so far? Kind of. Um, it makes sense, like, just play around with this file and like see like what weird wacky expressions you can put there that are still legal, um, and then like output the result somehow, I guess. Um, but for now, let's let's look at the rest of the code. So, um, so now we've we've figured out that my string holds the address of this string, which, by the way, there's no null character there. That's kind of weird, right? Um, just keep that in mind for now. And then my string len equals the length of that array, right? Um, even though you wouldn't call this a C string, right? Since it has no null character, and you, if you give it to printf or puts or something, it'll like say, oh, I'm gonna print out H E L L O W R L D exclamation mark new line 52, whatever <coughs> else junk is after it, because there's no null character terminating it. Um, but that's okay, because the thing that we're gonna pass it to expects a pointer to chars and a length. Um, so, what is that thing? Uh, what is that thing? Uh, that thing is four. We're going to pass it to four. <laughs> what the heck is four? Um, four is cis right, right? 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 Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So what's it take? It takes a file descriptor, uh, it takes a const char pointer. Can you guys even read this? Yeah? yeah? Okay. It's like super blurry up here, but, um, and it takes a count, right? So that's, that's fine, right? As long as it knows how long the string is, it shouldn't have any issue about not having a null character. Um, so, all right, so we're gonna pass a file descriptor, a char pointer, and a, a, a count, a, a length, right? So we, into EBX goes file descriptor one. What is, anybody know what file descriptor one is? Stood in. Close, really close. Stood out. Yes, stood out. Um, so. Uh, oh, zero um, is stood in. Stood, right. yeah. That's kind of, <laughs> that kind of tripped me up at first too, because you're like, it should be in, out, oh, error, right? One. Yeah. Um, so on Unix-like systems, we have the concept of file descriptors, and basically they're just a way to like the kernel will keep a table for every process, um, and on the left will be a file descriptor, and on the right will be some like 
weird long struct describing the file. So that's why it's called a file descriptor. Um, and uh, by default, every process will have three file descriptors uh, to start off with, except in really rare situations that are rare. You rarely see those because they're rare. Um, this one is stood in, stood out, and stood air. No, stood air. Air. Um, so this is like where you read stuff from, right? That's where you get user input. This is where you print out uh, normal text. And this, a lot of times, is where you put error messages. Um, so if you ever like, if you ever like in bash and you like, you, you, you execute some command and then you're like, oh, redirect its output to this file. If you like still get output and you're like, why am I still getting output? Uh, one of the most common things is that the, this process is outputting the std error, right? And to um, bash, when you just do this, it interprets, there's like an invisible one. This is basically redirect one to f. If you want to also redirect std error, you say, oh, redirect this to like error.log. So that's just a side note. Um, this isn't like a catch-all though, because it can still like write to the terminal, even it's kind of annoying in some pro uh, programs if you want absolutely no output. But anyway, um, one stands for stood air, uh, stood out, um, and so we give it a file descriptor. The second argument was a const char pointer or a char pointer, right? So we give it the address that we stored our string at, and then we tell it how many characters to print out, um, and then we interrupt OX80, uh, and then the kernel says, "All right, cool. I'm going to write." this thing of this length to this file descriptor, which most likely is gonna be our terminal, right? Um, and then this is the whole exit thing again, right? We, we say, okay, after we return from here, we're going to exit with exit status zero, um, and that's the end of our program, right? So let's see if it runs. Um, So make hello, and then hello. Hello world. Cool beans, right? So we, we figured out how to exit with an error, with an exit code that we specified, and we figured out how to uh, print out um, strings that we have somewhere in memory. Um, and it might not just be like constant data, like in this case. It might be uh, something that we built up based on user input and calculations and whatnot. And it might be something that we like stored on the stack temporarily or stored in the heap. Um, it can be anywhere in memory, really. Uh, as long as you have a pointer to it and a length that you want the kernel to, uh, to write. And uh, it might not be the terminal, right? It might be some file that you opened and you got a file descriptor back. Um, so the other two examples in this directory, uh, shell.s is the most important one. Um, and this is, uh, I won't go over it today, but this is how, this is some code that you might run uh, to get a shell back. Um, so it, it replaces the current process with a shell process. In this case, bin bash. Uh, but it could be other, could be a, could be a completely different program. Um, so yeah, maybe uh, maybe go over that, and see what it does, and look up um, look up the documentation for exec. Uh, you can find all of these like. Every system call, um, you can find documentation to it by running man two in the name of the system call. So exec, uh, well, exec, yeah, that's not the actual name. It's exec ve. Um, so that's where you can get some documentation about it and figure out what it does. Uh, same thing, like you know, exit's going to have that documentation, um, and we saw we saw write. So yeah, so maybe uh, maybe before next week. Um, tell me how this works, and uh, see if maybe you can like uh, figure out how to call a different program if you're choosing. Um, so, anybody got any questions? You guys are liars. I know you have questions. <laughs> we're being recorded. Oh, it's because we're being recorded.